All right, thank you everybody for joining us for today's C2 Smarter webinar. I'm Lizzie, the um, research project manager, and just some uh, quick housekeeping things before we get started. One is that we are recording this webinar and then we will be uploading it to our YouTube page. Um, and then also feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, as we were just saying, we'll likely save them into the end and then read them out uh, to our presenters. And then you can do so by pressing the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Nassif to get us started. Uh, thank you, Lizzie. Uh, and I. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to introduce our uh, first speakers in this series. Uh, CITO Smarter, as you know, is a center uh, about connected cities. And uh, one of the themes in our uh, center is resilient infrastructure. And for that reason, we promote the use of uh, different types of technologies, different types of sensors for the structural health monitoring of our infrastructure, as well as, for example, the way in motion technology for the use, uh, the, the sensors for picking up truckloads and uh, their impact on the infrastructure. Our We have this uh, state of the field series. We are starting with our two uh, great presenters. I had the pleasure of uh, hearing them at the ACI convention in New Orleans. And then we extended the invitation to share their work and their technology. I think it's a promising thing. Uh, at first, I would like to introduce uh, Don Klein from, uh, from Klein Engineering. He is very well known uh, in the area of post-tensioning, repair, and rehabilitation. His company has been in business for the last 18 years, is coming to us from Virginia. And he had a plethora of projects where his work really speaks for itself. In addition to his own engineering company, he's also involved in this new venture, uh, Infrastructure Tech, and uh, with his uh, business manager or director, uh, Wes Espanol. Uh, Wes also is the uh, director of the uh, uh, business program in this new uh, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure Tech. And he's also a member of ACI 444, which is a committee on structural health monitoring. Uh, I had the pleasure of establishing that committee in ACI more than uh, uh, 12 years ago. And not to my surprise, uh, his present, their presentation was really standing room only. And today they're gonna share with us their presentation on, on using uh, the type of sensors for corrosion monitoring. So Don and Wes, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nassif. Um, appreciate that very much. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the topic of structural health monitoring for the built environment. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you, you this afternoon. My name is Don Klein, as uh, Dr. Nassif mentioned, with Infrastructure Tech, and I'm here along with Wes Spaniel, who uh, together will be introducing to you a, an innovative technology for health monitoring of, of, of bridge structures. Um, this is really not a new technology um, as they, it's been in use now in Europe for over 10 years and over 100 structures. So it's not new, new technology, but it is relatively new here to North America. And we'll talk a little bit about how, how that's uh, arrived here in this country. Um, and just to, to get us started, you can imagine a world where um, you know infrastructure and bridges are instrumented with multiple different types of sensors that's all connected to the cloud and connected to BIM. And, uh, it, it, and this can give you just a plethora of information on the health and the performance of that structure throughout the service life of that structure. And so that's really what we're talking about here today is that type of technology. Today we'll be learning about two different types of sensors. One is a, a corrosion sensor and one is a moisture sensor. So we'll, we'll get more in, get into that. You can see here, this is just a couple of slides on, on the company itself. This is our team for infrastructure tech. It's uh, led by Catherine Farley, our CEO. Um, I'm a co-founder and uh, another gentleman in Miami, Yospani Balate is another co-founder. He, uh, he runs a construction company primarily focused on um, 
inspection and and, and uh, repairs of of infrastructure. And so we we got together and uh, and and came up with this technology. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit of background on my. I wear two hats. So I'm I'm involved in infrastructure tech, and I'm also the president of Klein Engineering. Uh, in Klein Engineering, we've been involved in evaluation and rehabilitation of structures for 18 years, and we have a lot of clients, a lot of various clients on, on terms of bridges and also buildings. And recently, they've come to us and they um, they've asked us. Is there a way that they can put some sensors into their structures to to be able to monitor their their buildings and their and their bridges? And so uh, we also do a lot of work with um, this contractor in Florida, and we got together and we we sort of scanned, yeah, you know, scanned the globe for different technologies. We looked, looked at different technology. We found some uh, these sensors in Europe and uh, with a company called Infrasolute over in Germany and in uh, in Switzerland. And we brought that technology here and created this new company called Infrastructure Tech. So that's really the genesis of, of Infrastructure Tech. Next slide, please. Uh, just a, lo a little bit more about client engineering. We're, um, we're a relatively uh, small company, but you can see that we have work uh, throughout the United States, including in, in, uh, in Hawaii. Um, and these are the states where we're licensed in blue, and we have offices in Miami, Charlotte, and the D.C. area, uh, probably soon in, in uh, the New York to Boston area as well. Next slide. And our, our specialty is, as I, said, is, as I said earlier, basically evaluation, restoration. We also do new designs, design of new structures. We also do a lot of post-tensioning and... Um, health monitoring of structures. Um, next slide. So uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to, to Wes, who's going to um, present for the rest of the, the, set, the webinar. OK, thank you, Don. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Lizzie, Dr. Nassif, glad to be here today. Uh, so we're here. Good afternoon. You know, I, I'd like to ask for your guidance today because we're here to talk about revolutionary smart building technology. I feel extremely lucky uh, to be surrounded by an expert expert audience that can contribute to our understanding of the importance of this, of this exciting realm. So please feel free to add uh, to this discovery today uh, via the uh, Q and A uh, that's associated with the Zoom screen, and uh, we'll we'll uh, attempt to uh, answer all your questions at the end. So thank you very much. Um, our learning objectives today are, are four parts. Uh, we want to start with uh, our corrosion of embedded reinforcing steel and post-tensioning is a major contributor to lifestyle costs for major bridges and infrastructure projects. Secondly, structural health monitoring sensors can be embedded into the concrete structure to monitor uh, key performance indicators such as temperature, humidity, and corrosion. RFID technology, which, which is our, our source of power, can contribute to the enhancement of durability and lifetime cycle uh, monitoring factors. The structural health monitoring system can be installed during original construction or during a rehabilitation project, and I'll show you uh, examples of that as we uh, venture further into the presentation. So embracing real-time data sciences helps us to better preserve and repair concrete structures ensuring that bridges, buildings, and parking decks are well-preserved, kept fully operational, and that users are always safe can be an enormous long-term challenge for owners and, con and concession holders. The question I pose is, if the growing structural health monitoring market provided instant value to your bottom line, would you be interested in discussing how we could create comprehensive lifestyle uh, monitoring, lifetime monitoring of the projects? Safety has a price. This slide should be familiar. Uh, traditional condition assessments have limited success in detecting early corrosion. Everyone in the build process, owners, contractors, designers, have a vested interest in assuring the concrete lasts long term. This graph depicts the cost of doing repairs on concrete structures. On the bottom, you have time. On the vertical axis, you have costs. The dark side is when corrosion is beginning and hasn't yet manifested on the outside of the structure, so you can't see it yet. If you detect at this point, you can take steps to mitigate the problems at much lower costs uh, then if you had to start chipping the concrete or replacing with rebar, et cetera. Uh, traditional methods can really only deal with the right side of this graph for the most part. 
Currently, your realm involves several types of, of condition assessments. You do a visual inspection, some sounding, some non-destructive testing, a lot of applications there. Uh, but by and large, when we see the outside effects of corrosion, we take action, uh, whether we see delamination, cracking, or spalling. By this point, it can become very expensive to repair the structure. To give yourself a competitive advantage in commercial assessments, we submit a more precise dive into the structural health monitoring. So as you're aware, corrosion is a leading cause of catastrophic structural damage and single point failure collapses worldwide. What are some of the prominent recent cases for the U.S. and what have we done to stop it? Well, before I even begin, uh, the recent collapse of a bridge in Russia um, and many other recent catastrophic uh, structural failures gives us a stark reminder of the vulnerability of aging bridges and infrastructures globally. Uh, most are, are familiar with uh, the, the uh, one on the left here, which is the Surfside Tower Collapse of Miami. On June 24th, 2021, at approximately 1.22 a.m., the Champlain Tower South, a 12-story beachfront condominium complex in the Miami suburb of Surfside, Florida, partially collapsed, causing the deaths of 98 people. Four were rescued from the rubble, but one died of injuries shortly after arriving at the hospital. 11 others were injured, and approximately 35 were rescued the same day uh, from that uncollapsed portion of the building, which was demolished 10 days later. A contributing factor under investigation still is long-term degradation of reinforced concrete structural support in the basement level parking garage under the pool deck due to water penetration and corrosion of the reinforcing steel. The problems have been reported in 2018 and noted as much worse in 2021. Uh, a $15 million program of remedial works had been approved before the collapse, but the main structural work had not started. The Surfside collapse is tied with the Knickerbocker Theater collapse as the third deadliest non-deliberate structural engineering failure in United States history behind the Hyatt Regency walkway uh, collapse and then the collapse of the Pemberton Mill. On the right, we have, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, uh, this was more recent, uh, the Ann Street, uh, 57 Ann Street in New York. The second floor parking garage collapsed onto the first floor around 4 p.m. on April 18th, 2023. The collapse uh, unfortunately killed the garage's 60-year-old manager and harmed several others. A, a new inner city law required all garages citywide to be inspected by 2027. And the, the DOB, which is the Department of Buildings in New York, as you, you would be familiar with, uh, had been scheduled to inspect 57 and at the end of the year. Back in 2003, they found cracks in the first floor ceiling, spalling concrete everywhere, steel beams missing concrete coverings, and defective corrosive concrete with exposed cracks. So some statistics and things to know uh, to, to give us proper context and into the aging structures. Uh, the median age of an owner-occupied home in the United States is roughly 45 years. Reinforced concrete is generally engineered for a lifespan of 50 to 100 years of properly maintained. So this means there are some structures that are approaching their quote-unquote safe service lifespan, while some have already surpassed the century-old age. 7.5% of the nation's total uh, of bridges are considered structurally deficient. Across the United States, there's more than 617,000 bridges, and 42% of these bridges are at least 50 years old. That means that also to note is that the average age of American bridges increased to 44 years. So what have we do, done to, to fix this? Well, we had government, we have uh, uh, different iterations of government funding. Uh, the federal government signed a $1 trillion uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill into law in November 2021, that funnels billions to state and local governments to upgrade outdated roads, bridges, transit systems, airports, and more. To date, it has begun 40,000 projects throughout the nation and has allocated $61 billion for fiscal year 2024. States supporting more inspections as a result, direct result from the Miami Surfside Tower collapse are New Jersey Bill uh, S2760 and Florida Bill A438. Those are the only two states, uh, as we know right now, uh, that have have uh, passed, uh, you know, prominent infrastructure bills. So back to the problem on, you know, why rely on traditional inspections when smart billing technology is is really on the rise. Back to the problem on how we find moisture and corrosion proactively. How do we justify enabling a structural health monitoring system or SHM? If a, the way we look at it is this: if a builder is going to spend a little extra time and extra money to make sure that certain processes like curing and formwork are successful, what prevents them from investing in monitoring to ultimately enhance the lifespan of the concrete? Uh, inspection Under quality, if you look over here, inspections are often too late. A lot of companies today are employing an innovative approach of scanning with AI. There are numerous startups in this market, and the basic principle is consistent across all these companies. They scan an object by taking high-resolution photos with a drone, robot, or other device. Then these photos are assembled into a 3D model. 
Based on this model, damage can either be shown on site using VR goggles through AI, or they can be examined and analyzed in detail on a computer. Typically, AI is used to detect damage, such as cracks, automatically highlighting all the damage on the building's 3D model. This allows planners inspector, or inspectors to document and record damages in a straightforward manner. However, these methods almost always focus on surface scans. That means they, number one, capture existing damages, and number two, can only reveal damages on the surface. So what's the solution? If our philosophy is such that the sensors and the technology built around it leads to early information on corrosion, moisture, and temperature, B, minimizes a potential order of magnitude and repair costs, and then C, saves lives, then how do we expand upon the notion that corrosion protection and management of the corrosion leads to a longer service life of the whole structure. We like to say detection early determines the cost of the repair. We essentially have this philosophy to start one step earlier. Scans as of today cannot look inside a structure, at least not without significant effort. So concrete's a significant cost, as we know, is the second uh, most used abundance in the world, used substance, excuse me, in the world after water. It is without question the most widely used building material, not a surprise. Our ongoing approach will be building an ecosystem of sensors to solve a multitude of problems. You can see we have laser-based static monitoring, uh, access monitoring, we're working on some strain gauges as well. Uh, but for, for purposes of, of this presentation, we're going to discuss our humidity and corrosion sensors. So where can you, you know, for now our focus is, is on understanding the, the wide ranging benefits of this structural health system that retrieves simple but important moisture and corrosion readings. And I'm gonna break down how each of these work uh, as we get a little further into the presentation. So where can you provide these systems or, or where would, you, or, or better yet, where would you use this type of technology? I mean, basically it's anywhere reinforced concrete is utilized. Buildings that have balconies susceptible to chlorides, anywhere de-icing chemicals takes place, uh, you know, for bridges. Uh, they're installed in underground parking garages, port facilities, facades, floor slabs, uh, basement rooms, foundations, wind turbines in Europe, insulation, tunnels, retaining walls, and many other objects. Where and how can you install the sensors? Well, the sensor should accurately uh, represent the material around it. We utilize coupling grout, which allows water and salt to reach the sensor. It's a highly mineralic uh, open poured grout. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure that the readings are accurate. So we, we need to allow, uh, you know, the chlorides, the moisture, uh, and the oxygen to get in. Uh, the surface is then patched with a durable finishing material, and it's essential not to cover it with high-grade mortar. Otherwise, the sensor won't receive the necessary input. So we don't want to use uh, a high-grade that's going to block uh, the sensor readings. Here's an example of coring a hole and packing it with the grout and mortar. Uh, one thing to note is the diameter of the sensor is is relatively is close to four inches. It's about three three point eight inches, if you will. Uh, and the hole that we uh, core out is actually just slightly larger than that at three point nine inches. So it's it's got to fit in uh, just snugly, as you can see with the thumbs up there. The scope of work for a structural health monitoring system always serves the needs of a client. The data can be integrated via common interfaces, such as through iframes into other systems, here enriching BM, BIM models with live sensor data, for example, BIM models. It's optimal if there's a BIM or 3D model and live data from the concrete in the form of moisture and corrosion. You can see it displayed in specific locations in this particular garage. This means either the data is directly transferred to their platform because we have gateways or multiple gateways installed on site at the structure, or the condition is manually monitored with a reading device and the data is transmitted with the manual reading. We essentially operate in the same segment as the 3D model construction realm, uh, or, or the exact same target audience, if you will, and we're interested in taking a leading role in the digitization of structures. As you can see, we go from one structure to the next, or excuse me, one sensor to the next, uh, the readings Green and red are binary readings on the corrosion sensor. Uh, I'm going to explain the actual sensor itself here in a little bit. Uh, but what that basically tells us is, is part of the wire has broken and that there is a corrosive environment. Uh, this particular reading that's shown here is a humidity reading. Um, this takes into a, effect of the temperature, uh, the resistance, uh, uh, the resistivity between the two stainless steel rings on uh, the, the moisture sensor itself, and that, uh, in a sense, gives us those readings. So this gives you an idea of what the web-based portal looks like. Uh, gateways use RFID technology to read data from wireless and passive sensors. Uh, we use power sources that are tailored to the customer's needs, cable, batteries, and or solar. 
Uh, you have data hub, data conversion, web-based visualization, and of course, this is fully scalable. This gives you an idea of what the offline model looks like. Uh, you can uh, apologize for the, the photo, but you can kind of see the beginnings of what I'm going to show you here in a second, which is uh, uh, an x-axis and a y-axis of sensors and then actual readings. The software developed by iTech aids in object management and data analysis. It stores data in the cloud, referencing and presenting the data in both tabular and graphical formats. <laughs> Additionally, data points are marked on the plans associated with the object. By integrating weather data and precipitation amounts, deeper analyses can be uh, conducted. Furthermore, the software includes a proactive alerting function uh, for exceeding threshold values. When the sensor is scanned or read, it is always a point in time observation at the time of reading. This is because the sensors are passive. They have no internal power source and thus no internal memory. If data at regular intervals are of interest, especially helpful for moisture trends, uh, it is recommended to install a gateway on the exterior above the sensor that performs continuous readings and transmits the data to a cloud. The reading cycle of the gateway is customer specific and can range from hourly to once a week. This interval can you know, be changed at any time through an over the air update. I'd like to point your attention now to a uh, case study here uh, that we did in Koblenz, Germany uh, a couple years back. Um, essentially this, this was a project, uh, but we also obviously installed the monitoring systems and, and we took some data and, and you know, uh, came up with uh, uh, our results as, as is here. So essentially, this depicts a realization of digital sensor-supported proactive online monitoring of corrosion and moisture events of a bridge structure during the repair. So this bridge was constructed in 1972. Uh, about 46,000 vehicles passed by daily. Uh, all surfaces were repaired after sandblasting to remove the massive chloride contamination on the top surface. Uh, a half cell potential survey was performed to see the hot spots in the bridge. If you're not familiar with uh, half cell potential, it basically tells you the difference between the, elec uh, the electric nodes uh, versus the network of rebar that's uh, in, the, in the construction. Uh, based on potential field plans, a warning system was designed and implemented to monitor the corrosion status and moisture development at critical points in the concrete where temperatures were measured as well. So obviously, bridge authorities uh, elected to use these, and we installed humidity and corrosion sensors at hot spots emulating high potential for corrosion. So we, we put them at bridge drain locations, bridge joints, PT anchor block locations. We also installed some in locations that were not susceptible to corrosion to create a controlled reference point. The overall rehabilitation costs uh, in, in the transfer was probably about $30 million, uh, but the budget for the, the monitoring system was only about $100,000. Uh, Don here went to the bridge, used one of the handheld devices afterwards, and, and saw that it was still performing well. So like I mentioned previously, here's an example of the data you're going to receive. Uh, the vertical axis, different, you have different sensors and different layers of wire that are, represent, that are represented by the corrosion sensor. So binary results, green is good, red is, is no good. Um, and then you can see uh, on the y-axis that you have the, your different types of sensors. And then on the x-axis, uh, you have your different levels of, of wire breakage. Okay, this is a web-based portal that shows our humidity sensors. Uh, this maybe, sh uh, hopefully, I, I can uh, zoom in a little bit more here. Uh, actually, no, I can't. I apologize. But um, the blue indicates humidity and moisture on the specific days and intervals, and orange indicates the temperature. Orange is the temperature curve that the sensor measures in the concrete. Uh, the gray line is the temperature that the gateway measures inside the bridge, and blue is the humidity. In the case of humidity, it should be noted that the scaling on the y-axis has, has been selected with a very high resolution. So it looks as if the humidity changes a lot. In reality, however, the change in moisture value is between 2 and 2.3% 2 uh, moisture. So what can we conclude? Uh, the contribution to digitalization of infrastructure monitoring, we contributed to the durability, sustainability of the structure, and then we created a proactive online visibility of early warning parameters and lead indicators. Okay. Um, so let's get into the tech here a little bit more. Uh, the tech originated in Europe. A lot, a lot of uh, the construction technologies nowadays seem to come from Europe. Uh, this, this particular tech was a joint venture with the Fraun Fraunhofer Institute in Germany and our partners InfraSalute. 
Uh, so it comes from Germany and Switzerland. So the 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 sensors themselves, you saw a picture of it. I'm going to uh, continuously show pictures of it here. Um, they require no batteries, no protruding wires. Uh, uses a very innovative RFID technology. Um, I've mentioned that a couple times, and I forgot to give a definition for those of the uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. RFID is is similar to uh, having a credit card. Uh, you know, going through your line at the grocery store. Your credit card doesn't have any power, but when it's uh, swiped through the reader. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it, it, it opens up the power and then allows the system to, to either debit or credit um, that card. So uh, that's, that's essentially how, how our sensors work. And it also contributes to its mean time failure, which is, uh, w which from developments and, and from some of our research, um, we've, we've decided that these sensors can stay in the building uh, 80 years or more, even though it said 200 years, but 80 years is probably more uh, relative to um, to, to what we're looking at here. So, um, okay, so the technology and, and sustainability of the resilience, the expected lifetime of the sensors is 70 years, as I mentioned, uh, but we put the sensors through, a, through an apparatus to verify our proposition. We have data to support those claims. Okay, so the, as I mentioned, I was gonna get a little deeper into the two different types of sensors. So we have moisture sensors and then we have corrosion sensors. The moisture sensor measures moisture and temperature of the concrete. Measures, as I mentioned, it measures the electrical resistance between two stainless steel rings. With the additional information of the material in which the sensor is embedded, the electrical resistance is then converted into moisture and mass percentage. The way the corrosion sensor works is it measures temperature and wire breakage. It also measures a self-referencing point to ensure the sensor is functioning correctly. Uh, the data received by the reader in binary format all, already resembles the values that will be output to the software later on. So it doesn't need a half cell potential, et cetera. It measures actual corrosion of steel. The way it works is there are several wires around the sensor. Uh, you place the sensor over the rebar or, or a little bit higher so that we can create a, a full warning system. Uh, the wire is very similar to the reinforcing steel. Uh, this has the same carbon material. Uh, once chlorides or carbonation get inside the concrete and destroy the, the passive layer, uh, it'll attack the wire of the sensor first. The wire closest to the surface indicates early corrosion, and then you can watch the progression as it gets closer to the reinforcing steel. Uh, the dimension of the sensors are such the diameter, um, the, the height is about a half of an inch, and the diameter is about 3.85 inch, as I mentioned. Uh, additionally, we're, uh, we've uh, developed smaller versions of the sensors uh, that have a diameter of 4.8 centimeters and with the same height of a half an inch and a range of 10 centimeters. So where can you install these, Brit? Where can you install the sensors? Uh, they can be installed really in the most uh, remote places inside the concrete where no scans take place. Here we essentially use an antenna from the bottom to the top of the column where the data will be extracted from the structure. These antennas can be extended over 250 feet, so there's a lot of possibilities and applications with the system, especially in hard to reach places. You can see here from the column bottom to the top, uh, we've connected them, the sensors with the antenna, and then we've created a reading unit on the top uh, that allows us through the gateway uh, to retrieve the readings at whatever intervals that we decide. So you need something on the outside to transmit the data. Um, you know, you, you have an on-site portable handheld gateway or a fixed gateway. The sensor is passive and has no power, as I mentioned, but the reader can extract the data from the sensor. This is a, a, a picture of Catherine extracting some data from uh, the sensor here. Uh, the gateway can be either battery powered, solar powered, or hardwired. Uh, you adjust data fr transmission frequency as is without specified parameters. As long as you're within six to eight inches of the sensor, you can store it locally or transmit it to the cloud. The gateway periodically sends information to the cloud, then data is stored in the cloud, and then can be analyzed by the end user that can show up on dashboards. Uh, could be DOT, owner, engineer, facilities manager, asset, asset manager, uh, you know, whoever's looking at it. And as I mentioned, there's two types of gateways. So upon successful transmission of data from the sensor to the reader or the gateway, the next step involves transferring the retrieved sensor data to the iTech cloud. This transmission is accomplished using narrowband IoT technology, or otherwise known as Internet of Things. Uh, narrowband signals are emitted from the mobile network towers and are characterized by their ability to penetrate buildings deeply and their cost effectiveness in data transmission. So, you know, I basically say, you know, what is our actual company can what can our actual company do in reference to these applications? Well, we can essentially provide the whole package A to Z. Uh, I could see the system providing better representation between engineers and property owners. 
uh, depending on how often you know you're taking a look at at the data results, this creates more uh, dialogue between the the two entities. Of course, um, you you don't have to use a, a specific construction company. Uh, we would uh, advise uh, the users of the sensors on how uh, best practices on how to install. Uh, we would show and support an installation system uh, and then create a monitoring system afterwards. Okay, so how did we get here? Uh, I mentioned uh, the collaboration between the Fraunhofer Institute and our partners InfraSalute uh, a little over 10 years ago. Uh, so the concept, uh, every the technology had, has been developed, and we actually have sensors in buildings uh, that that have, have been stayed uh, you know, staying in buildings for more than ten years or up to that time. Uh, so presently, we're promoting, advertising, marketing, and improving, and we brought the technology to North America. Our mission is to be the number one solution provider for concrete health monitoring technologies and services, and our vision is to protect and preserve the built environment. So traction, um, structural health monitoring is gaining traction in you know products that monitor the strength of concrete, products that monitor corrosion made up of mostly wire technologies with wires protruding on the outside, products that measure crack widths, and then nothing really exists today that's comprehensive of the life of the structures itself, which is why we intend to save millions on repair costs. These are some projects uh, that are, are realized uh, with, you may be familiar with some of these companies. Uh, we have the sensors installed in Frankfurt and Berlin Airport, uh, and we're starting a project with Amman Resorts and Hotel here in Miami in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be installing some on a, on a facade of a rehabilitation project. So FAQs, I'm sure you have a few questions here. Hopefully I can cover a few of them um, be, before you ask. Uh, what is What is basically uh, what's the probability that these sensors are going to fail? Well, there's a frequency of less than 0.01% due to stringent manufacturing quality standards and sensor-specific quality assurance. A secondary sensor would be installed near the original sensor using core hole drilling. That's our, our quality guarantee, if you will. Uh, the non-functional sensor remains in place as its failure does not compromise or damage the structure. And studies uh, back up all of these uh, findings. Uh, what is the maximum allowable depth for the installation? Well, it's limited to roughly 12 inches or 30 centimeters, but it's possible to achieve a depth of over the length of a football field using an extended antenna, as I uh, showed you through that, that column earlier. Uh, with an extended antenna, the reading unit and the measuring unit are housed in two separate enclosures and connected with a permanent cable link. This allows, for example, measuring at water level in a shipyard while conducting readings from the top of the quay wall. So what are considerations during a retrofit? It's essential to ensure the core hole is not too large uh, to enable efficient and quick coupling to the existing concrete. It's also essential to thoroughly document the sensor's installation position in the plans uh, to, facil to facilitate locating the sensor during future readings. Attention must be paid to orienting it with the roughened surface parallel to the main surface, ensuring that the first measurement layer represents the upper wire layer in the installation scenario. Uh, when you saw the photo of the actual sensor, there's a granular part on top. Uh, that is, that's intentional. Uh, we use that as we tie, if we wanted to tie the sensor closer to the rebar so that we know exactly when the corrosion uh, begins, uh, that uh, the, uh, the granular aspect of that top part allows us to uh, sort of uh, fit it snug and make sure that it doesn't move as we pour in concrete. So how do I, as an architectural engineer, or client access the data. Uh, I mentioned it previously, but data transmission can be categorized in two stages, from the sensor to the reader to the gateway, and from the reader gateway to the cloud. Data is transmitted uh, directly to the iTech cloud immediately after reading, allowing for immediate access even while on site at the location. The only requirement is to access our online software, which is provided upon sensory delivery and an installation. You can see the uh, picture of the gateway up in the reader. So what is their durability? Do they have reusability? Sensors are highly suitable for construction sites and have been specifically designed to withstand high levels of stress. Uh, the, the material around it is epoxy resin that's uh, put there through injection molding. Uh, and there's various tests regarding the durability, low capacity and robustness uh, that, were, that were conducted beforehand. The results were documented in a separate report. Uh, corrosion sensors can also be used once in an object. However, if the moisture sensor is installed in an environment where it can be removed and cleaned uh, as its contact services from surrounding materials, it can be reused. For example, this is uh, applicable when using insulation layers in roof construction or in mud brick construction. 
So what are possible uh, installation positions? What affects the reading range? Uh, I've been asked before what the area of influence is. We have to keep in mind this, these sensors are not, these sensors are, are basically uh, finding proxy corrosion. So uh, we want to, uh, we want to find 90, we want to cover 90% of the issues with 10% effort. And that's basically the idea of, of the design of the system. So they can be used in ground areas, ceilings, wall structures, really anywhere we're still, uh, you know, uh, anywhere we're still concrete, uh, still reinforced concrete is used. What factors can influence the reading range? Uh, you have a list here of operation underwater, embedded in concrete, et cetera, and this, this shows you the factors. So what's the future of all this? Well, uh, structural health monitoring devices give you the ability to collect enormous amounts of data. Uh, you can use the, these analysis algorithms and statistical modeling to identify patterns and detect anomalies. Uh, in addition to that, you could probably use uh, particular data into creating built, uh, you know, future building efficiency models. Uh, you can analyze historical data, environmental factors to predict future degradation. You can also inform owners on how best to build new and preserve existing structures. And with that, I will turn it back over to Don. Okay. Um, thank you, Wes. Um, yeah, this... I think this is the last slide. It's really just to give us an understanding of of the process on how we would work together with the team to install and monitor the structure. Um, and so typically you would have a, a structural engineering firm, you know, like a TY Lin, HNTB, or um, you know, there's lots of engineering firms out there who are who are working for the DOT. If we're talking about bridges working for the DOT or the uh, bridge authority to um, to monitor to inspect the bridges and to and then to monitor them inspect them over over time uh, if the, if a if an issue is is identified on the bridge then um, it's then of course the engineer will write a report the um, there's two different approaches then if you take the ver the, the one on the top, you could do traditional inspections over time, which is every uh, one to two to even five years, depending on the DOT. Uh, traditional inspections, which give you, uh, as as West mentioned, it gives you information mainly from visual inspection, maybe some NDT uh, detection methods and that sort of thing. Um, but the problem is that it it's very expensive to to do inspections. It's you know, access is difficult on on a lot of these these uh, assets and uh, once you find out you have a problem it's uh, becomes very expensive to repair and so the next if you take the downward branch on this uh, flow chart then you, we would do online monitor monitoring so infrastructure tech or itech as we call it itech would provide the, um, the support uh, to the to the asset owner to provide our materials um, and then we would work with the engineer, the structural engineer who's who's working for the DOT. We would provide technical assistance for installation. The contractor would install it, or if if uh, if the asset owner wants, we can install it. Um, and then we would provide support all the way through uh, monitoring, installation support, and then and then support through monitoring, including setting up uh, you know custom dashboards um, for whoever's doing the ultimate monitoring. And that, that could be the DOT uh, or the structural engineer. Um, and, uh, and, and we would work, every project is different. So we would customize and, and work with the, uh, with the asset owner to make it work in, in accordance with the, however they wanna see it. Um, so that's, that's the approach that we would take. And um, I, I think with that, uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Don and uh, Wes. This is a great uh, presentation about your uh, technology. Uh, while I think uh, Lizzie will look at the q and I have a quick question. Uh, so I see that your technology can be also applied when you are doing repairs and not only in new structures. Um, how do you, for example, if I had a structure, a bridge deck, and the bridge deck is, let's say, I'm I'm doing diamond grinding. I'm exposing the rebar. 
and I'm going to put an overlay on top. And I notice that the rebar are maybe half life, you know, there's a little bit of corrosion, but they can take another. Uh, can we place your sensors there and kind of correlate the corrosion with the ongoing of the rebar? You know, or or is it something that it has to be new new structure? In other words, yeah, is this a good repair? Uh, I mean, when you are doing repairs, is this a good mechanism to keep an eye internally on the structure? Yeah, I can I can answer that. Um, yes, absolutely. You can use this uh, just as we showed on the bridge deck in Koblenz, Germany. You can use this in a repair. You can uh, you can you can uh, you know do the demo or the concrete removal. And then you're going to repair the re any corroded reinforcing steel, and uh, and then you're going to put back a, you know patch material or repair material, and then an overlay. Um, th this can be placed. This can this can be placed within the uh, the repair itself if you're going all the way down to the rebar, or if you're just doing an overlay, you probably would want to um, you know set set the anchor or set the uh, sensor down into the concrete. Uh, and then use the coupling mortar to to and, and then put the overlay over over top of it and it would it would detect um, it would give you an early warning for corrosion and it also would, would let you know if, if, if you want to put moisture sensors it would tell you if you're getting um, you know if there's if there's uh, some you know if you're getting moisture into into the concrete as well yeah I think I saw that in the video where you you had like a, a hockey puck and so you don't have to go all the way down to the rebar. You could just do it maybe. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't have to be attached to rebar or anything like that. You can put it wherever you want to find out if corrosion activity is is present. Okay. That's you can cool. tailor, yeah, you can tailor the system to meet whatever needs uh, or vulnerabilities you're looking for. Okay. I think, uh, Lizzie, I think we have a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A. You want to take them? So yeah, we have two right now. And just a reminder that if you have one of your own to type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. So the first one is how much data or how many days for SHM do you need to make a recommendation to the owner or decision makers in terms of repair plans? Um, I can take I can take yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's there's no real one size fits all approach. Uh, I, you know, I think when when you look at sort of the design of of you know how many the, uh, another question similar to that is that that we often get is you know how many sensors do we need to use is you know would you use ten sensors for every one hundred meters per se, uh, but no it's it's really um, you know it's it's really about um, you know the the sensors themselves are part of an you can create whatever ecosystem that you're looking to create. Uh, based on what data you're trying to retrieve. So the, the amount of days, if I can go back to uh, one of these screens here, I can give you an example. Okay, right here. You can see uh, we we decided that we wanted uh, ten intervals per month um, on on this uh, data sheet. This is our online software. Uh, so here you can you can see where the the blue is is the moisture, uh, the pink is the the temperature of the gateway, and then the uh, green is the the temperature near the sensors. Uh, you you can see from July 26, roughly between July 26 and August 29th. Uh, we took a data point uh, there for the temperature, uh, and then we came back, and uh, this particular asset owner came back, uh, you know, months later to take that second, uh, you know, measurement uh, data. So, uh, it, we, ideally, you want to do it in in, in uh, close iterations, or you want to see cons a consistent patterns, uh, specifically when you're looking at the uh, humidity sensor. Um, but you know, it, it's really going to be up to the asset owner how many times you, you want to retrieve those, those data readings and, and to decide that, uh, you also have to look at, okay, if I'm going to have a gateway or a reader, if you have a reader, that means that you're probably close to the asset and you, you know, you want to do a, 
a, a normal inspection of the property. And while you're doing that, you can, you know, take some readings. Uh, the alternative is to put the gateway down and you can be in Singapore and have a building in New York. Uh, and you can, you can check those, those readings anytime, anywhere, just based on how you tailor the system to yourself. Great. Um, the next one is, it is unclear what kind of data the sensors are providing. Is it showing the percent section loss of the rebar in real time? And if not, how can the data be used to obtain this information? Um, I can I can take that. Um, it it's the corrosion sensor is uh, it's a go no go sensor. So it's a it's either not corroded or it is corroded, and and it does not give you information about percent section loss. So what it what is telling you is is that um, you have an environment that is set up to allow corrosion to progress. And, and so the uh, if you have chlorides and moisture and oxygen, then it's it's going to create a, an environment that's that's uh, prone to causing corrosion. And it's going to attack those wires. Those wires are a small diameter, so it's going to attack it. And, it's, and, and once the wire is broken due to corrosion, then you'll get the uh, the no good reading, the red reading. And so, uh, and as, as Wes said, it's, it's, uh, it, it gives you information about uh, uh, trends and uh, you, you, wanna, you wanna see trends over a period of time. So if you're seeing uh, just one sensor that's, that's, that's uh, showing corrosion, you may not wanna take action on just that. You may wanna see additional, uh, you know, additional information come in before you take some action to do some kind of mitigation or repair of the structure. Great. I think Great. there's one more question. Yeah, one more question, which is one sensor covers how much area for giving data? Um, so, yeah, I can I can answer that. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it's it's it, as I mentioned, it's proxy corrosion. There's no specific um, there, there's no specific area of influence, if you will. Uh, but as as Dr. Nasif asked, you know, can you put the sensor? Can can you put it above uh, the rebar so that you it's a warning system far in advance, or you can put the sensor very close to it uh to to let you know when the, the corrosion the corrosive activity has come close to the rebar um from there on you decide uh how you're going to act if you're going to start on on a repair um or you may wait until it gets to that second wire uh which basically tells you uh the, the corrosion uh has progressed to to a point where you really got to take action um yeah i think that this is a i, I have a follow-up question to that is it possible that you know, so so what your from your data, I think it's a critical thing. We get what we call the corrosion initiation time. In other words, how long does it take the chloride to penetrate to whatever level you have your sensor on? I think we will be interested also in the corrosion rate of the actual rebar. So I think your sensor gives that, you know, the first in corrosion initiation period. Is it possible to use your sensor also? to get the corrosion rate. In other words, can I put the sensor very close to the rebar and use a wire that is made out of the same material as the rebar, and, and then I can, I can maybe detect the corrosion rate of that wire and then associate that with how much the rebar could be corroding over time. Is there, is there have you thought of like maybe using that to get the second phase of corrosion, which is the actual rate of corrosion? I, I don't know if it can give you the rate of corrosion because it it's once once the only information you're getting is the uh, is the actual um, you know breaking of the wire, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure you can get a rate of corrosion. Uh, maybe maybe there needs to be you know it, and we're we're not saying that this technology solves all the problems and gives you all the information you need, but it certainly gives you um, some key information about about initiation or having the environment that's set up for corrosion and and you'll see corrosion actually happening on the on the sensor in terms of finding the rate um there may need to be a follow-up uh, half cell checking or something like that to to give you the rate 
Yeah, I think uh, to compare it to what other corrosion sensor that I'm familiar with, it's almost like a lab. They they use like um, kind of uh, a chemical lab on, on trying, and they place it beside the rebar, but they put four types of steel. One of them is similar to what the rebar is, and then they monitor the corrosion of those small pieces in that environment. However, I think, you know, I really never gotten good data out of that, you know. <laughs> so maybe maybe because your wire is very thin, it doesn't have enough time to to keep, you know, the corrosion to penetrate. It just breaks and it gives you that zero one signal. But if the wire is a little bit thicker, perhaps that could be the your your second type of sensor where you could monitor how long would it take to break that thicker type of wire and and that could maybe correlate it to the corrosion well, rate. yeah that's a really good point and i can i can confirm that uh that that wire itself uh went through several stages of development and they they tested breakage uh, regularly over the over the course of a couple different years and um you know the end result was was that size so that we could just test the wire breakage and then to further answer your question uh about you know checking the corrosion rate i know that it doesn't uh, assess, as Don mentioned, I know it doesn't assess corrosion currents, for example, uh, but the idea here is, is more of a warning system uh, as opposed to giving you uh, specific cor corrosion data. But I will uh, I will see if there's a way that, you know, we can detect corrosion rate. That was a very good point. Yeah, yeah Mr. like, like uh, Dr. Nassif said, maybe if you had two different thickness wire wires on the sensor, um, it would give you additional information. Uh, we could ask we could ask our partners in Europe about that. Yeah, I think that would be very valuable. I mean, what you're getting is is I think it's unique, um, you know, because there's no other way other than trying to uh, you know remove the uh, concrete and look roping. This would yeah. be something very useful to get the phase one, and then and then you know that's all you need actually is if you want to protect bridges or or buildings. You want to make sure you know, you know that that uh, before you get to that stage, like you you mentioned in your earlier slide. Uh, I think I think this is this is excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation. I don't know if there are any more questions. Okay. Yeah, there is one more. I think we have a little bit more time for we that do. one question. <laughs> yeah, please ask away. So uh, my prop my proposed bridge deck area is fifty five hundred square foot square feet. In that case, how many sensors will they need to install? So it's 5,500 square feet. That's not a very big bridge deck. Um, so I, I think we'll, what we said is that it's not a one size fits all. It really depends on where the vulnerable points are in the bridge deck. So you'd want to understand the, the structure and where are the vulnerable points and where are the low points? Uh, where, where, if it's an old bridge, um, are there is there already um, patterns of, of uh, deterioration that you want to monitor? Um, so if it's a brand new bridge, uh, 5,500 square feet, and um, I, I would, and if it was, and, and I'm, just, I'm a structural engineer, so I'm going to say, uh, you know, there's always a trade off between cost and, and data. And so you'd want to you'd want to put in enough sensors that you would be able to feel comfortable. So, 5,500 square feet, brand new bridge deck. I don't know. Probably I'm just throwing out something here. Probably 20, 20 sensors uh, at the most vulnerable locations, which would be at low points. So this would be like uh, the canary in the mine shaft. You know, this is just to tell you what happens, and and you know for the uh, worst case scenarios. Yeah, low points, water drainage areas, seals, and road transitions uh, prove proved to be of crucial importance. Right, right. Would you be Would you be giving them? Would you give guidance on on when you yes. if, if a client like that asks for? Uh, would you be able to uh, help them know what are the exposed areas or what would be the most vulnerable areas? Yes, uh, absolutely. We we're happy to do not not necessarily as a. Uh, um, you know, infrastructure tech is not a professional services company, so we wouldn't be able to give um, those types of recommendations. But uh, obviously, client engineering is involved as well, and so maybe through our firm we could do that, or we could um, hook 
hook them up with other engineering firms that would be happy to provide recommendations for that. Great. Any more questions, Lizzie, on the q and I... If you have one, uh, submit it now. We do have a few more minutes. Otherwise, we can wrap up. Okay. I I think uh, we're we're uh, out of respect to everybody's time. I think we're reaching yeah. that point. And I want to again uh, thank Don and Wes for their great presentation. Thank you again uh, for uh, you know uh, providing us with this information. And we look forward to have you become part of our center. I just want to remind everyone of the audience that CETO Smarter is now um, you know uh, 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 launching a new series of. Uh, uh, lectures on structural health monitoring and uh, for infrastructure. And we have part of our, uh, you know, uh, uh, resilience infrastructure uh, theme uh, has been renewed for another five years. Uh, and our, we, you know, the center includes University of Washington, uh, University, Rutgers University, where I reside, uh, University of Texas, El Paso, and uh, uh, CUNY, you know, uh, the City University of New York, as well as University, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, North Carolina a and and another university in Houston, I, I forgot, but I apologize for that. But thank you again for all, for your attention. Thank you for joining us and look forward. I just want to remind everyone, Lizzie, that next, the a uh, April 25th, we have another seminar uh very uh, about the cloud you know whatever we do with the data sexual health monitoring data and and the use of it on the cloud this would be by eric zucker uh, from action tv and we'll also will announce the a uh, couple more seminars for the month of may everybody thank you for your attention and uh, this will be uh, this is recorded and will be residing on our uh, uh youtube channel for the center and it can be accessed will provide the links for everybody that he can share it with the larger audience in the future. Again, thank you very much. And have a wonderful day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.